So I literally taught myself trademark law slash started reaching out to mentors and trying to create relationships and learn the practice area. I remember paying a couple of attorneys to sit next to them while they worked and filed trademarks so I could just watch and take notes. And I mean, I really stitched together my own education, made a ton of mistakes. By the third position, it was an IP position. So all that experience, and that was really part of the time frame, if, if anyone's graduated around that time frame, you know, the chances are you got used to kind of creating your own brand in, in an interview to say, okay, I know I don't technically have trademark experience, but I do because I have filed all these marks, just not at a trademark law firm. And so I think that kind of made me stand out in a sense like, wow, you really want to do this. And I'm like, you don't understand. I don't want to be a lawyer unless I can do, I can't be a lawyer unless I do this practice area because I hate everything else. Welcome to the Founding Partner Podcast. Join your host, Jonathan Hawkins, as we explore the fascinating stories of successful law firm founders. We'll uncover their beginnings, triumph over challenges, and practice growth. Whether you aspire to launch your own firm, have an entrepreneurial spirit, or are just curious about the legal business, you're in the right place. Let's dive in. Welcome to Founding Partner Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Hawkins. I'm excited about today's guest. Today we've got Sonia Lacani, who is a trademark lawyer, but she's also got a pretty cool, I won't even call it a side business, but it is a, I'll call it a legal educational business, but I'll let her describe it the way she wants to describe it. But Sonia, why don't you tell us about you? Give us a quick background. Uh, tell us about your firm. You know, is it what you do? How many folks you have helping you? That kind of thing. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you for having me. You guys, Jonathan and I go way back and I'm honored to be included on the podcast. So thank you for having me. So as he mentioned, I am a trademark attorney. I have my own law practice. I've had my firm for a little nine and a half years of the 14 I've been practicing. And my second venture is 4L Education. So it's my modern take on attorney education. So the 4L being, you know, the year we wish we would have had that would have been really nice to learn how to practice law in law school. But in lieu of that, we we developed 4L a few years ago and um, it's been going strong ever since. So on the law firm side, I still do practice trademarks and exclusively trademarks, no litigation, only filing and prosecution. And on 4L, we focus on trademark education for attorneys and law students and paralegals who may be interested, but we are looking to expand subject areas soon enough as well. Oh, that's cool. And I, I want to explore that a little bit. You know, some people say you don't need thir your, your third year of law school, so 4L should replace. Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, cool. So, so take us way back, you know, the journey to become a lawyer. What got you there? This is a, a semi-known fact now at this point, but my mom is actually the one who forced me to go to law school. It's a funny story. I never wanted to. I hated every minute of it, actually. And the, the full circle moment is that I would ditch class all the time. I would never go. I never wanted to be, I hated reading. I was like, why am I here? I hate this. But in our culture, you know, I grew up Middle Eastern and in our culture, you have a couple of choices when it comes to career paths and medicine was not going to happen. And so you get lawyer, doctor, you know, something coding, engineer, STEM also was not going to happen. And so when I would look at my schedule and try to arrange it for the next semester, I would always try to build in four day weekends, like really be in law school as minimally as possible. And so I found a trademark class. It fit the last window I needed so that I could have four day weekends. And lo and behold, I went the first day and Sarah Stadler was my instructor. She was, she's an adjunct professor, also practicing law. And she just made me fall in love with the practice area. And it was the only class, not only did I never miss, I sat front row center. I was early and I got an A plus on the final because I just was like, it made sense to me and it clicked. And it was the only class I didn't hate. And I said, you know what, if I have to do this, I'm just going to do trademarks. And I had no clue about the lifestyle of it or what it would involve. I had no clue how to file a trademark, right? We just learned theories and case law and stuff. And it was just seemed fascinating. So I took it and ran with it. And here we are 14 years later. That's funny. So you had three, three or four options and, and law was the only one you could take and you, you, you didn't want to do it. Um, so, so you graduated in 20, 2010, which I remember that those times that was right after the great financial crisis. It was sort of the aftermath, you know, I guess that really happened 08 or so. And then the fallout lasted two to three years. And I remember, I remember getting calls and resumes from the graduates of 2010 and it was like brutal. I mean, it was, it might be at least in our lifetime, 
the worst year ever to graduate in terms of jobs out there. What was it like for you on that end of it? You are not wrong. It was horrific. I think all of us were scrambling. And, you know, I went to Emory for law school. I had an amazing experience with the law school itself. And I loved my classmates, we, but we all had the same experience, which was we were all just scrambling, trying to find jobs. And now this is a fairly well-known story, but my first job out of Emory as a licensed barred attorney was $17 an hour answering phones because it at a law firm, but they didn't have an opening for an associate, but it was like a way to be at a law firm and not sit around and like twiddle your thumbs all day. Because I think when you graduate and finish the bar, there's a little gray area of, okay, I want a job search, but I understand that I don't have a bar here to offer. So it's a little bit of like a less freak out period. But once you're licensed and you're sworn in, and if you still don't have a good job or a job at all, that's where it starts really eating at your confidence where you're like, wow, is my life over? Like, did I do all of this for nothing? And so I was really starting to panic. And it was a way to be at a law firm without actually being, you know, and it it was a med mail firm. It was awful. It was absolutely awful. But we made it work. And along the way, like I said, you know, I knew I wanted to practice trademarks. I didn't know what that would entail. I didn't know how to learn the practice area. So you're starting to see the little specs that eventually developed into 4L, which was, you know, you create things, typically entrepreneurs create things because they don't exist already. And so I was scrambling trying to figure out, you know, I had this sort of day job thing, but I had a Twitter going, which was Lady Lanham ESQ. The Lanham Act is the Federal Trademark Protection Act. So, you know, I took that from that. So I was always immersing myself. And so one that first position led to another a proper associate position, also not practicing trademarks. But the second one, at least it was, okay, well, if you want to do it, you're on your own, like you, you have to bring in the business and you also have to execute the services. So I was like, Oh, okay, I guess. So I literally taught myself trademark law slash started reaching out to mentors and trying to create relationships and learn the practice area. I remember paying a couple of attorneys to sit next to them while they worked and filed trademarks so I could just watch and take notes. And I mean, I really stitched together my own education, made a ton of mistakes. By the third position, it was an IP position. So all that experience. And that was really part of the time frame, if, if anyone's graduated around that time frame, you know, the chances are you got used to kind of creating your own brand in, in an interview to say, okay, I know I don't technically have trademark experience, but I do because I have filed all these marks, just not at a trademark law firm. And so I think that kind of made me stand out in a sense like, wow, you really want to do this. And I'm like, you don't understand. I don't want to be a lawyer unless I can do, I can't be a lawyer unless I do this practice area because I hate everything else. So uh, that's where we started. And so that position then led to another one. And that was my last one. So it was four jobs in four years, <laughs> famously. <laughs> you know, I, I'll tell you that that is a remarkable story. You know, um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if other of your classmates, you know, took all that initiative. I mean, you know, you busted your ass, you actually paid lawyers to sort of teach you, you know, most people after they're done paying for law school, they're like, they don't invest in themselves ever again a lot of folks. So that wasn't pretty impressive. So the firm that you said that they said you could do it, but you got to go get it and you got to do it yourself. What kind of firm was that? And were you having to do that legal job and then sort of the trademark stuff on top? How did that work? Yeah, it was a general practice firm, small firm, maybe about four or five lawyers. If I recall, it was, we used to joke that it was door law because they just took anything that came through the door. (laughs) And and none of those things were trademarks. And I remember the partner was like, I I don't even like mess with it. I don't have any idea. It was more like PI centered and sort of more like B2C services, right? Versus B2B services. So I was the one that kind of introduced that aspect. I'm like, you're missing out on a whole revenue stream because the people that you represent in a car accident, what if they have a business? And then what if you could serve those business needs as well, right? So it it, it was something that I I don't think they loved the idea because it was just so new. And so I came in guns blazing in this firm that had been around for long before I'd been practicing law with all these new ideas. But that was kind of a pattern is that I've always just had these crazy lofty ideas to other people. But in my mind, they make sense. And once I started to trust myself over time that you your hunches are right, you just have to find the right environment to cultivate those. And so Yes, I did have to do my day job, which was heavily in PI and, you know, random B2C services. So I was learning. I think I did a DUI hearing once and this. I was like all over the place. And then at night and on the weekends, I would research slash, you know, try and find clients and then also try to 
learn how, I mean, it was, you're learning the practice, so you're finding the clients and then executing the legal services. Any one of those would be enough to take someone out. <laughs> and I was doing all of it. And I don't know why. Sounds like the firm, didn't, the firm didn't know how to handle you. Sounds like. They thought it was nuts, but they were like, wow, you're, but you're bringing in revenue. They're like, this, this kid's crazy. I'm like, I just give me, just trust me. Give me a second, you know? So. So, so were they, so you were getting paid by that firm while you were developing, you were learning how to get clients, service clients, and all that stuff. Right. So they were paying yeah. you at least, right? Yes. I got, got a salary for my day job. The first wave of trademarks that I did and sort of self-taught were pro bono because the promise was, okay, well, like, to be honest with you, I, I know enough to issue spot that you do need a trademark. However, I'm not really sure how exactly the system works. So if you would allow me to, you know, so they would pay like the filing fee and some of them were nice enough to kick me a couple hundred bucks or like, a, you know, 50 bucks or something on like an Amazon gift card or whatever. But yeah, that was very early on. And then when I got the actual IP position, so that we were just talking about firm number two, when I got the third position, that was an IP firm in Atlanta. And so I moved to Atlanta. I was not there at the time. So I moved back to Atlanta. After, so I graduated, left, come back for this position. And it was a, it was actually an IP litigation firm. So it was still really hard to try to rustle up filings, but that's all I wanted to do. So once again, it was like, okay, well, we're a litigation firm. We litigate trade, you know, trademark infringement. And still I would keep, you know, but at least I had a better setup where it was, the firm was set up in a way to actually deliver those services. And I, you know, I was able to ask some questions here and there. And then I was recruited by a, an attorney at, you know, what, what ended up being my fourth firm, but I met her out at a networking event. And again, we were having the same kind of conversations and she's like, you are a star. Like you need to be in an environment where we can really, you know, invest in you. And like, what if I brought you over? We would invest in your education. We would invest in your business. We would give you a business development budget. Cause I was amazing at closing clients. Amazing. They would send me to dinner and I would come back with a retainer check in my hand. You know, it was just like amazing. And she was like, what if we did like invested in you? And I'm like, I've never had that. No one ever like, gave, I was always, I've been paying out of pocket for all this stuff. So I was recruited to that firm, which was my last firm. And of course, it, it, of course it just turned out even better after that. It was my favorite firm of the four, nothing wrong with it at any point. I think when people see you resign, maybe it indicates that something went wrong or that somebody was unhappy but not as to the firm at all. I couldn't have asked for a better scenario in that moment of like, thank you for rescuing me from this situation I've gotten myself into to like a proper full general transactional firm with a litigation arm in case we needed it. But there was so much investment into my development. And if I had been the person that wanted a very clear path to partnership, that would have been the firm for me. And I would have stayed for the remainder of my career. The, the, I still have such an immense respect for all of the partners. I still keep in touch with a number of them. I send them work. They send me work sometimes. And we just, we run into each other. It's great. But ultimately when I resigned, it was just the bug that I, you know, the, or the itch I couldn't scratch, I guess. It was just like, I, I wanted to create something and I didn't really know what it looked like, but I want, I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just wasn't sure how that would shake out. And so I woke up one day, had no plan. Not at all. I just woke up one day. It was January 30th, 2015. It was a Friday. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to walk in and resign. And they were like, what? I was like, yeah, You're I'm crazy. Try. I am crazy. I'm yeah. absolutely batshit. Like I'm crazy. But I, but the thing is that this is, this has been a recurring theme in my career path, which is bet on yourself and trust yourself. Look, I knew that I had, I knew that I could trust myself to figure it out. So like famously in entrepreneurship, they say that it's, you jump off a cliff and build a parachute on the way down. And I just had a really distinct faith in my ability to do that, even if I didn't know what it looked like. So, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you are clearly one of those unemployable kind of people. So, I would get fired uh, from any job at this point. Yeah. I really, I'm so used to making the rules and deciding things of how I want it to look and nobody ever gets it sometimes, but I just, I, I still have a lot of trust in myself. And I think that's what I've re learned to rely on is, you know, yourself better, you know, your capabilities, the best, you know, what you can and cannot accomplish with the right resources. I think that's the most important thing is, you know, people say, but you have, you really have to trust yourself. And if you know, for on the other end too, if you know that you don't really, you know, you don't operate well in, in, in uncertain situations or you don't operate well under pressure or you get overwhelmed really easily, or you get stressed out really fast. 
then you know that you need more of a clear cut defined path in your field. And that's helpful information too. That's good insight to have, you know? So. so some people are just born rainmakers. I think obviously you are that. What about sort of the entrepreneurial bent that you've got? Is that, have you had that forever since you were a kid? Is that something you grew up in? You know, where did that come from? Yeah, I, I did the like lemonade stand, cold water on a hot day bottles as a kid. You know, my mom was like, this is so, I grew up in a really strict Middle Eastern upbringing. My mom was like, this is so unsafe. I don't want my daughter outside. And I was like, no, it's just the neighborhood. It's fine. You know, so I, I just always, I don't know. I just always had it. And I think I, I grew up then, you know, I read a lot of books. I wasn't allowed to really do much. I really, like when I say I grew up really strict, I really was. And so my mom didn't have me in a lot of activities, didn't want me out and about doing stuff. So I spent a lot of time by myself in my room reading books. The one thing she did let me do and fully invested in was the trips to the library. We would go on a day, I would come back with a stack like this, all just anything and everything that looked interesting. There was no rhyme, reason or pattern to the kind of stuff that I would read. And then by the next day, I'd be like, I'm done. Can we go back? And she was like, this is crazy. This kid's insane. So I turned into a really fast reader, killed the vocabulary building. I was, I mean, I read a dictionary at one point, but cover to cover and learned all these words. I think my parents were just like, oh, we don't know what to do with her. But interestingly, not that you asked, but I, I do feel like it's interesting to note that none of this translated into good grades ever. I was always really bad in school. Yeah, my, obviously I, I touched on my law school credentials. I was like a C well, law got, student. Well, you got an Emory. <laughs> Yeah, good school. I think they looked at it and was like, this California girl wants to come here. And Emory, you know, is a really high rated school. Even back then in 2006, uh, 7, 2006, 7, when I took the LSAT and applied. But it wasn't what it is now in terms of this level of national recognition. And so I think they were like, this girl from California wants to come to Atlanta. And, you know, this isn't on the bio page, but I followed a guy. I was dating a guy and he's the one that asked me to apply to Emory. He's like, it's still a top 20 school. And I was like, I'm waitlisted at UCLA, excuse me. But I didn't make it off the waitlist at UCLA eventually. I never did. And it was time for school to start. Emory not only admitted me, but with welcoming arms and a p partial scholarship. I mean, it made a dent in things, but it was something, you know? And so it just seemed like the, I just, sure, why not? let's roll. Everything has just been like a cal semi-calculated, sure, let's roll the dice. Okay, so so about <clears throat> almost ten years ago, you decided to go out on your own. So you know, take me back. So you, you walked in in January. You said, "I'm resigning. I'm going to start something." You know, what was going through your mind? Did you have clients? Did you just want to have control your own destiny? Why did you do it? I think that I could see the very clear path of what the future looked like, which is kind of goes back to that question of uncertainty. Like, what's your comfort level with uncertainty or certainty, I guess, as well. So like, I think at the time I could see the path very clearly laid out of what my future was going to be like. And I think the fact that there wasn't, didn't seem to me at the time that there was any room for something different or new, like, so this is just it. Like I just show up every day and I, if I do what I'm told, I make partner. And I'm sure a segment of people listening to this are like, yeah, doesn't that sound amazing? Like what part of that is a problem? And I'm like, the part where there's no excitement, there's not, no day is going to be different. This is just going to be it. And I think that really made me sad in a way. Like it really made me a little like, that's it. And I was just like, oh, okay, I did all that to just know exactly what's going to happen. And I think I was chasing the excitement of the unknown. I wanted something new and different. But also by then I had been, you know, I'd read so many books and I had started following some of the biggest entrepreneurs in all the, in different industries. Right. And so I had these role models and their stories. And so I would listen to podcasts just like this one. And, you know, it's, it's still a little bit of a pinch me moment. I told you this before we started that like, I can't believe I'm the one being interviewed now and that people want to hear what I have to say when I was sitting here soaking up every interview, every article, every, everything by founders and creators. And I'm like, I want something like that. Like, I don't know what, but I want something. And so yeah, I didn't have a plan. I, roughly speaking, I thought I would do, I would create a partnership with some other lawyer friends that I had met along the way, but that imploded probably like two weeks into newfound, if you can call it freedom. But yeah, that imploded pretty quickly. So I was on my, I just realized again, I was like, oh no, this is just, again, going to be the same thing. Like it doesn't seem very exciting. And so I was like, all right, well, you need income coming in. That's kind of a thing. So 
thing you do is at least create a law corp. Like that's the first thing you can do. At least it'll bring, get some money coming in. And then the next half of it, I couldn't have predicted all the crystal balls in the world, which is a majority of my clients were like, well, we want to work with you. We chose your firm because of you. You're the one that we met at a lunch or got, we got your name from someone else. And by then I had become very well known in my immediate circles for trademarks, even though I was still, but well, by then I think I knew I had a mastery of it by fourth. Yeah, I was a fourth year associate at the fourth firm. I had a decent mastery of it, but I had built that personal brand for so many years that people had just come to associate Sonia with trademarks. If they knew who I was, you got to go to Sonia. And so I had been building a lot of business. I had brought in a lot of business into that firm I was in. And I think that's maybe what gave me like one speck of confidence to say, okay, well, you've been bringing in the business and you've been doing it, which is what the deal was. So you could probably do this on your own if you had to. And so a lot of them came with me and, st- and followed and they were the first cut of people that sustained me for the first few months. And then that turned into more and turned into more. And here we are. So, so, so <laughs> I, I want, we're going to shift and talk about your other business in a minute, but I want to sure. get a little bit more on the law firm. So when you started, it was just you. How has your firm evolved over the last 10 years? Is it still just you? Have you added people come and gone? What's that look like? Yeah, I think front facing, it's always been me. There has always, from the moment I could afford help and support on the back end, it's looked very different along the way. But from the moment I could afford it, I knew it was important. Because again, I'd gotten my entrepreneurial degree from all these founders and their stories and following them. And I would just soak up everything they said or, you know, lessons and stuff like this. So I knew, you know, you've got to delegate, you've got to, you know, you've got to hire, you've got to get help. So I've had help always, but I've always been the main attorney, at least public facing. If there's ever been anything that I didn't have the bandwidth or the knowledge to handle, I would refer it out. And I, I learned that relationship turned into two way where then people would say, okay, well, clearly, you know, and I think most attorneys have their favorite stuff or the things they like to do. And so once you kind of find the sort of your puzzle piece in that, in, in your colleagues, it becomes really easy to have that when you don't have to ask for referrals and beg for business and neither do they. We just know like you, you are really good at trademark trial and appeal board, the TTAB stuff. I am not, I don't want any of that. So, you know, I'm going to send all that stuff to you. And then they were like, okay, well, I have a search, you know, I've got a couple searches we need done. And, you know, can you gauge the registrability of these following marks and rank them? And they need some counsel on this. I'm like, yes, absolutely. Show up. Got, you know, So that's what that looked like in terms of building the business. But yes, I have worked with a number of attorneys over the years and I still do. So they're just not public facing, I guess. Yeah. All right. So let's shift. So you've got this 4L education company, Uh, you know, sort of tell us what it is. And then when did that come to life? When did that happen? Once again, I mean, it's probably starting to sound a little old already to whoever's listening, but man, this was the furthest thing from a plan. But again, it, it, it is a surprise, but it's not when you think of, I was going to create something eventually, we just didn't know what it was. So 4L ended up being the second something and I'm probably not the last if we're being honest. I mean, like I just have the spirit of it and I enjoy it a lot. I enjoy the puzzle of solving problems and putting things together and saying, okay, well, if this is the end goal, you know, my mind just works in that way. I'm a professional problem solver. And so I feel like that's just what I'm built to do. And I enjoy creating things and thinking of stuff. And so the way that it started was I was in my third position. So the IP firm, and, you know, I was always out at networking events and different things. And I met, I met a lawyer. So now we're in Atlanta. I met a lawyer and He had, his name is Braxton Davis, still a friend of mine to this day, great guy. And he had something called the Patent Institute of Training, PIT. And it was sort of what I'm doing at the moment, but back then for patents, patent lawyers, right? And so training them and teaching them actually how to do the thing versus theories and case law and statutes and stuff. And he said, well, you know, with patents comes trademarks. You can't really have that conversation separately. And so I would love to have you as a guest instructor for one of our boot camps, like just the days and times. And if you would just come and I was like, you know, not me thinking on the back end. I'm like, man, the ink has barely dried on my law degree. Number one, like four years later. And I barely have a mastery at this point, but I was like, I know enough to teach it. And that theme that, that was in my mind the entire time, which is I struggled with trying to find true practical instruction, no fluff. Just show me how to show me where to click, where to say what not to do, like cautionary, all this stuff. 
And so I said, yeah, I'll teach for you. Sure. So I showed up for one guest panel. I had the best time and the reviews were incredible. Everybody was like finding me on LinkedIn later and saying, you know, do you have anything else that you teach? Do you do? I'm like, no, that's it. I just, no, I have to go back to practicing law. And then he asked me back for something else. So I did a few more things with him and I just realized the testimonials and the reviews after the questions that people would get. So many people wanted to connect afterward. And I just had no idea that I had tapped into yet another sort of interest, gift, talent, whatever skill set, whatever you want to call it, in taking really technical information or not intuitive into just click here, do this, just trust me on this, right? Like just conversational, make it easy. And so it was really a result of following what the market asked me to do. And I learned those words from entrepreneurial, you know, podcasts and books, right? Is I had no idea what any of that stuff meant, but I did know that the market people tell your customers will tell you what they want. You don't get to decide. And so after I forget the magic number, but after so many LinkedIn messages and coffees, people were like, if you ever decide to teach, I am in. So just let me know. Like, here's my email address. Put me on a list. I didn't have a list, a list of what? <laughs> like, what do you mean? So started an email list, started collecting. And then I woke up one day. I don't know if I would advise people to do that because it's like not really the best idea, but I tend to do things before I'm ready for them. Let's put it that way. I tend to just pull the trigger on things before I have all the details. And I think that's a good and a bad thing, but it saves you from overthinking it sometimes. You're like, I'll figure it out, right? It's that figure out ability of it. And Marie Forleo, one of the many entrepreneurs I've followed for a long time, has a book called that finally. It would make sense, right? That everything is figure outable eventually. And so so many messages. I said, you know what? Let me try to design a course. So I, I still remember... I think it was like a Saturday night, a glass of wine. I was like, okay, how quickly, what's the time frame that I could teach trademarks? And like, how long would this realistically take from zero to mastery? I was like, let's just call it two weeks to trademarks. Let's just see. So I built the outline. It's fun to find now because it's evolved so much, but that was the first cut. And it reminds me of like Jeff Bezos sitting in his garage, like that in the very beginning, early stages, right? In the nineties of like building Amazon. And you all start somewhere. And so All I did, I created a curriculum. I said, okay, twice a week for two weeks in two to three hour increments, I will teach this curriculum. And here's what I'll teach. Here's the syllabus, all this. And I was like, wait, how do I accept money? Well, law pay link. (laughs) No clue what I was like, sure, law pay link. And wouldn't you know it, but 17 people signed up. And it doesn't sound like a lot, except that, and and there's so many more pieces to this, but you have to think about, okay, curriculum. Where are you going to get these customers? How much are you charging for it? How are they going to pay you? Like, wait, all what's this, you know? But I, I talked about it with one of my brothers who is also an entrepreneur. I come from a long line of entrepreneurs. So maybe we should have touched on that in the beginning. And they've always, he was always pushing me, even from the beginning. He was like, you don't need to practice at a firm. Like you can, you should quit and just do your own thing. And so I sat down and I said, I have this idea. And he's like, okay, so like, what are you going to charge? And I was like, I don't know, like three ninety five. He's like, for two weeks of legal education? And I was like, well, I don't want to, I mean, I got to make some, I don't want to do it for nothing. So anyways, we mutually landed on seven, seven ninety seven or nine ninety seven. I forget. Anyways, all I know is I made close to $17,000 that day. <laughs> I was like, holy shit. Wow. That's, yeah. I mean, right. Like whether you're doing it completely wrong or not, that's nothing to, to, you know, scoff at. And so I was like, okay, we're on to something. This is something that people and are so, willing so, to pay so, for. So yeah. real quick. So yeah. Had you already built the course or did they, did you sell it first? No. Because problem- I hear that a lot. You know, a lot of people say, you know, go sell it first, see if there's demand, get the, you know, get the cash or at least get the commitments, then build the course. Is that Well, yeah, you because it? yeah, a hundred percent. And because by then now I had shifted my overall entrepreneurial study and focusing to course creation. Once I decided I wanted to really follow this, then I started following course creators taking courses. I had taken a couple courses on how to build a course. And I famously have said to, I've met him a couple times now. And so he, he, it was really cool to be able to meet him and tell him, but his name is Ramit Sethi and he's Amy Porterfield, Marie Forleo. And he had a course at that time called zero to launch. So it was like, get your idea, hone it in. Here's how you build it, market it and execute it and all this. And I'll be honest with you, the course had tons of modules and tons of stuff. I watched about two hours of it while I was washing dishes a few nights in a row, maybe like five or six. Right. And I just, I was like, all right, I got it from here. I'm like, you paid for this course. What is wrong with you? But I was like, I got it from here. And I just intuitively 
And that's, I, you know, I, I regret that that's not like a teachable skill. I, I don't know how to teach in, intuition when you just have a, a knack for it. And I imagine that it's like other areas of expertise, like singing or acting or something else where you're just naturally gifted, I guess, in that little lane and you just have to run with that lane. And so I have a natural intuition for business and what's going to work, what's not going to work. And so I knew better. I knew not to teach it until I had sold it. And Seven, I mean, it was nine ninety seven times seventeen or something like that. So it wasn't exactly seventeen thousand dollars when you minus like the two percent fees of the credit card and whatever. But it was enough to get software, get a couple of VAs to help and execute it. But yeah, it was a set of Zoom links and a curriculum. So it was like these days and times. Here's the yeah, so, yeah. So I want to dig in. We'll get into a little bit of the details here because I'm really interested in this. Real quick, thanks for listening. If you're getting any value out of this podcast please take two seconds to hit the subscribe button and leave a five-star review. It would really mean a lot to me. Now back to the show. So you come up with a, a catchy name. You sort of float it out there somehow to, to your network. You start getting interest. They're saying, yeah, let me sign up. You, you quickly take a course to figure out how to do it. So what was going to be your delivery? Was it all video? Was there, was there you know, live chats or you know, one-on-one calls? What was the structure of sort of that first version at least? Yeah, the first version and, and for many versions thereafter at the time was here's the syllabus, date, time, topic, you know, a few bullets on what you're going to learn. Here's the Zoom link. So the idea is you log on at that day and time. And I teach live. I've got my slides, my little faces here in the corner, chats open. It was a live experience. It went in, you know, the discussion would take us in all kinds of directions, but I had the core. I mean, you have the core three stages of practicing trademarks, right? Well, four, if you count the intake and consult process, right? But you've got your search and analysis of the risk. You've got the application process. You've got office actions, if any, and then registration, hopefully, right? Then there's a million ways it could go off after that, but that's, I mean, you have your core curriculum. And so it would take us in a lot of different directions, which was cool. So people got a live experience. They could ask questions. And the promise was in the duration of this two weeks, right? Because it was two weeks to trademarks. And in this two week period, if you have any questions, you have open access to my email, send any and all questions, curiosity, concerns, and then I will answer them at the top of the session next time, right? So you get that kind of like live Q and A. Also during, I would upload the recording afterward and send it out if people missed. And then they got, yeah, they, so, so they had so the videos and the slides. Let me after, cut yeah. you off there real quick. Sure. Let me cut yeah. you off there. So you'd record it and you'd upload it. Was there a, a platform where people could log in or? No, I sent video files for months and oh, only wow. because, yeah, no. And I couldn't believe people were okay with it, but I didn't know any better. That's the thing. I didn't, you know, there's a little pesky details, but again, I realized I was like, oh, well, just like how there's case management software for you to like keep track and stuff like that. And I don't know how I stumbled on it. I was like, oh my God, are you serious? There's whole platforms where you can just log in and upload and what? And so that was the first, that was three platforms ago though. So we've come a long way, but so what the conversation we're having now, this was in um, mid 2017 is when I developed and marketed the first cut of two weeks of trademarks and had my first cohort. And then I just kept teaching it every single month and it grew and grew where people were like, I have missed the last two enrollments. When's the next one? When's the next one? And I realized very quickly that there was never going to be a magic time or a place that everyone could make it right. And then it all changed. I don't, I wish I could, I should go back in my email from those days, but one person was like, I mean, you have the recordings, right? I'm like, yeah. Like, what if I just paid you for the recording? I'm like, what? Why would you want to do that? You can't even ask me. I'm like, okay, well, no, I feel bad. Cause what if you have questions? I'm like, okay, so here are the recordings. (laughs) links to all the video files attached here psychotic if you have any questions at all i'll get on the call with you like i i feel like this isn't that great but they're like no i, I have kids i don't I'm never gonna have time and the idea when i was like literally a bulb i was like wait if there's one person who's willing to pay for recordings after the fact let's just test this and you just have to be okay with testing just see what happens like i have lived my whole life on this motto even my personal let's just see what happens like who What's the worst that can happen, right? And so, and not that this is part of your Q&A, but I do feel like somewhere I should say that like money management's a thing. And I've never been, I would say in like the top 10 percentile of money management, but I'm definitely not in the bottom half. I'm decent in the sense of I never, ever spent everything I made. And I think it would have been really easy at the time when you make 
we keep saying it's 17 grand, probably closer to 15, five, maybe 16, right? With the fees and stuff, whatever, right? To go out and buy a Chanel bag and put a down payment on G Wagon and do all this stuff. And I was like, no, we, we're not there yet. Like we are just getting started and we don't know when we might need that money. And by then I had got, with running the law firm for that long, I had known that was two and a half years into running the law practice. I know that you don't spend everything you make and that you need to reinvest back in the business, meaning hire and build and these sorts of things. And so I think that helped is to have a reserve. And so it was, I was able to then, I think, what did I do at the time? You know, I looked at a couple of platforms, picked one, but yeah, so I just, let's just test this. And so I picked the best set of modules from the last six or seven cohorts that I had done my favorite set and not coincidentally, it was the most recent set because I bettered it every time, right? If I noticed that people were mm -hmm. asking the same sorts of questions, the very next PowerPoint deck had those questions in, right? So you don't even need to. So I, I did. I kept improving, tweaking, improving, tweaking. It was a labor of love, but I just fell in love more with it every day. And, you know, let's be real. The testimonials and the reviews don't hurt, right? When people are cheering you on and thanking you for, you know, teaching them a practice area that now you know, they made an extra 10, 15 grand, which at the time, now my testimonials are, I may, I had my first 100K month because of you, 50K month, doubling, tripling my last year's revenue because of what you taught me how to do. And we'll get to that because there's so much between that statement and where we're at right now in terms of what the course can teach to get that. But to have people telling you this, and it's not a fluke story, will do a lot for your confidence. So even if you're unsure of certain things, you're like, no, I'm doing something that's that's winning. And so, yeah, I, it was then that it went ever, evergreen. And so I found a course platform at the time it was called Kartra had it for a couple years. Uh, we'll get there, but you know, realize it, we were, it wasn't a fit moved on and so on. So yeah, that's how it became from live to evergreen. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. You sort of, for lack of a better word, sort of stumbled into the, you know, live to evergreen, sort of evolution, but you know, somebody like, I think it's Russell Brunson, somebody like that. He says, you know, early on, he's going to give a live presentation, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 times before he turns it into evergreen, because that's where you get the feedback the, all the questions you said that you then worked into your, you know, the last version, you know, you sort of need to give it live a bunch probably. And then it just gets better, better Then boom, you can do live. But so let's, let me ask this. So it sounds like your customers are, lawyers, right? So the question is, you know, exactly who, you know, lots of types of lawyers, who are your sort of ideal customer for that platform or that program? And then how do you find them? How do you get in touch with them? And maybe that first group were people you knew, but you know, take us through that. I have yet to run an ad to this day, either for the law practice or for 4L. Well, let me back up. So 4L, people are probably like, wait, 4L, you just had two weeks of trademark. So from 2017, as I was teaching these live enrollments, month to month, and then in 2018, late 18, early start of 19 is when that whole conversation about making it evergreen had started. And I thought at the time, okay, well, how do I sort of balance this idea of, did I just get lucky the first few times, right, to now? And so the course, that course then and still is called Two Weeks to Trademarks to this day. 4L came last year, actually, in so late 2023, when I had been teaching that course. And I know I'm fast forwarding, but I'll come back in a moment. I just want to close the loop on why it's called 4L. I, after two weeks of trademarks had this wild, fast, demonstrated growth, it introduced the idea of lots of spinoff topics that are related but separate in, and parallel in the sense of, okay, well, when you get an office action, obviously, it would teach that, but that's a whole thing you can go into by itself. So then I developed a five and a half hour boot camp with a colleague of mine, Eric Pelton, who's long been a friend and fellow trademark practitioner. We taught it together, killed it, just wild success. So there was that, there was lots of other sort of spinoff trainings. And this relates to the question about not only how do I find my attorneys, but also what attorneys would be interested in, you know, in this material. But during those live cohorts, you start to, if you're paying attention, right, your customers tell you what they're looking for, what they want. And there were repeated questions after the curriculum and the course substance. It was, okay, so how do you find your clients? Who needs a trademark? Like, who are my, right? And so I'm starting to find that I'm teaching my marketing, right? So pulling from Lakani Law, how did I build Lakani Law to, well, this is what I did. This is what worked for me. So you've never run ads? No, this is what I do. 
right? I do organic refer referral building and content and this kind of stuff. So I taught that, which then introduced the idea of what if the course had an additional arm of business development, marketing education, and all the things you need to know out how to do a consultation, how to price your services, right? So the whole suite of practicing trademarks, not just practicing trademarks. And man, I wish I had buckled up because I had no clue what that was going to unlock. But it, it makes sense as we talk about it. Yeah, of course you want the whole story, right? And so that's how I realized what attorneys wanted from me and what attorneys would be interested would be, you know, on the first level, if you're doing business transactional work, formations, small, anything with businesses, contracts, counseling, strategy, stuff like that, founder work, startup work. I mean, you have to have trademarks as part of the conversation. There's because if you're building a business, you got to call it something. What are you calling it? OK, well, don't you want to make sure you're allowed to use that name? And if you have thought of a really great name, don't you want to make sure you own it? Right. Why would you build a brand that you don't own? So that's the first level. I have discovered many more types of attorneys that have been interested as I look at our now I'm in the hundreds of alumni. I would say we're probably I think we just crossed 700 attorneys like maybe in the last three weeks from 2017. So wow. four years. I know that's a ton. I'm just like, so, so, oh. so, so real quick. <laughs> so like, like I'm a run of the mill, just business lawyer. And yeah. I want to add, I, I, instead of referring that work out, I want to add some of the expertise in house. So, so your course is where I would go. Right. Yes. So that's, I think, so we have sort of two columns at this point of the attorneys that I think slash no, I still say, I think I have a feeling, but I'm like, no, you know this now, like say it, you know, like I'm working on that. But I know for one, it's business transactional patent attorneys, right? This is the, if you're versed in patents, you got to know trademarks. And again, law school didn't teach us. So unless you learned on the job somehow, and if you did, like I did guaranteed, there are gaps in your knowledge, right? You're stitching it together as you go. The problem, I say this all the time, to anyone who will listen, I'm like, we don't know what we don't know. It's your blind spot back here. I have no clue that had I known that was a thing, I would have done it, but I didn't know. And so lest you click the wrong button or type the wrong thing in the application, and now it's gone to the USPTO and, oh, if only someone had told you, you don't do that, right? That's going to backfire or whatever. And so patent attorneys, franchise attorneys, right? So it's interesting that they're two different businesses but they have so much overlap because the groups of people and the demographics I just listed are the very people I work with to get trademark referrals. So the sweet spot is, well, if you're an attorney and you find yourself referring this work out to someone like me, then if you'd like to keep it in-house and you'd want to have the, and really could, what if someone showed you that it could be a full service that you have with all these components rather than just a one-off filing that you don't think is worth your time. So I think people, I take people from the transition of thinking it's a one-off or just kind of a whatever, like loss leader, low level kind of commodity in terms of a practice area to a full-blown lucrative, potentially, you know, high revenue thing. And so that's one avenue, right? The other avenue has surprised me over the last couple of years, but it's the lifestyle benefits of being a trademark attorney that has created the second parallel, which is I am in crim. I'm doing this insert area that I just hate. It's high stress. The clients are driving me crazy. It's so much crime, custody battles, like litigation. Like I hate the word litigation. So like I just can't even express how much I am anti-litigation for my personality type, right? Like I, I am default wired to be in a good mood 99% of the time. And so I could just know that would change if I was in an adversarial world. And I don't have, I don't, you, this is not me discounting myself. I don't have what it takes to be a litigator. I don't. And that's okay with me because I have found my sweet spots, right? And so the other parallel of attorneys that, are, that would be interested in this material and in my courses would be, I want something a little bit different. I need a break from what I'm doing, even if it's not a full transition, just a, you know, and what I've taught a lot of my you know, with 700 attorneys and counting, I've had a lot of success stories and a lot of case studies. And I've been able to either take that first group and grow from a one-off or whatever to something, re you know, really high end and lucrative. I've also taken attorneys from whatever practice area they were not happy in, typically family, honestly, I see family law a lot. And I take them from that to a, almost a full transition in some cases. But if not, even if we're at least splitting it in half, 
that then you can maybe be a little more choosy about the kinds of family law cases, for example, that you're taking, right? And you don't have to take everything to meet your revenue goals, for example. So that's a lot of different ways it goes into, but those are the attorneys that are interested. And that's how I find them it, it is, I mean, the first cut was people that were, I marketed to the people that would send me work. I'm like, do you want to just learn how to do this? You yeah. know, so. All right. So I'm going to ask a question that all the lawyers out there are thinking. You're a trademark attorney and you're out there training your competitors <laughs> yeah. and you're training your referral sources yeah, to, to do, do the work instead of sending it to you. What are you thinking? Well, what in the world? Crazy, isn't she? I'll be honest. I didn't think that through on day one in 2017. My intention in a not so kind way by some, you know, hater attorneys, as I like to call them. So th you don't get this far, by the way, without having some haters along the way. There are definitely a, probably a couple people that are not my biggest fans because, and I'll tell you why. I have a feeling that I know why. It's because of what you just said, when you're out here creating a bunch of competitors and doing all this. But to me, that's such a scarcity mindset. You know, and I know we throw these words around like abundance and scarcity, but there's so much trademark work to go around. I couldn't possibly handle all of it if I wanted to, and nor do I want to. And same for you, hater, and same for you, whoever else is hating, right? Because so to me, all I hear in that is that you don't have confidence in your ability to market and develop business for yourself. And so you're worried about this little piece of the pie that you thought was yours. But in my mind, the pie gets bigger when you share it. And I have my own testimony because my Lakani law crossed seven figures in 2020, which was three years after I started teaching two weeks of trademark. So it's not, a, it, my own business grew unintentionally, but because I think I got on the map higher and higher of she does trademark, she teaches it. Uh, and so you have someone who's completely just out of left field in an audience in a talk I give that's like, look, love everything. I just, can you just take a look at this trademark? I'm like, yeah, sure. Right. They're like, I don't want to learn it. Like, Much respect. And then that would turn into this or that. And because there are attorneys who want to learn a new practice area. I'm very happy in my trademark world. If you asked me to learn franchise law, which would really behoove me to do so because it's such a part and parcel of what we do, I don't want to. And so if you came to me, right, and we're like, I'm going to teach you how to do franchising. Here's a course. I'd be like, no, thank you. I am very happy in my own little world, but I will send you any franchising work that I happen to have, right? You see, so there, it just depends on what someone's out there for. But yes, absolutely, those comments have been made. There's, and my answer to that is my opinion is that there is more than enough work to go around. The USPTO filing numbers back that theory. So, I mean, year to date, I just checked the other day, year to date, I think we're in three or 400,000 applications filed. No, sorry, 700 and something applications filed year to date. And we are in just finished June. So we're halfway through the year and 330 something thousand registered marks year to date from the USPTO. That's a drop in the bucket. How many trademarks can you possibly take yeah. on effectively? Come on, right? So it, I, I well, don't see well, well, you said you, you said three things there. Number one, which I agree with, is the abundance mindset. Number two, there's more work than any one person or one firm could do. And number three, your revenues have gone up since you've started training people, right? Who knew? Who knew? That's, that's it. There it is. Yeah, there it is. And so I, I think, though, that learned this from the entrepreneurial and entrepreneurs that I followed initially. And it's only cemented my thoughts on this, that people always want, you know, your most proven, your hack for time management, your productivity secrets and whatever. You got to fix your mindset. If you don't think that you can, or you don't think that you deserve it and all these sort of leafu things that are not so leafu, the, I really, as I share my story and Again, it's a pinch me moment because I still don't think I'm done. I'm like, no, I'm just getting started. Like I haven't even, I barely now have a mastery on, I think everything. And I have the, and that's why we chose the name for alls. Cause I wanted a, an umbrella brand that would, you know, two weeks of trademarks is our most famous course or, or well-known offering. There's so many more and that leaves room for non-trademark stuff because there's so much else that we can share by way of attorney education. And so, yeah, I've proven it with the numbers, but you know, you really have to have a mindset around this sort of stuff. And um, you have to believe that you can and that you deserve it. And for whatever reason, like I've said a few times today, that I that never went anywhere. I always knew I would figure it out. I always knew I deserved to be successful. I, my deal with myself in the mirror was if you put in the work, you will get what you want, but you got to put in the work, right? There's no magic pill. When I when people see my my case studies and testimonials. They're all over my YouTube channel. They're all over my course websites. I'm very public about them. And it says something that so many attorneys are willing to put their name, 
bio and headshot next to a quote that says, I got them a hundred K month, right? Like that's legit. That's not like a get rich overnight. But if you listen to the stories that, and I interview mine, right. And I'm like, tell us how you got here. Everybody does different things with the material. So it's really fun to listen to. And they like, I put the work in, right. They didn't, this isn't a get rich quick. They're like, if you think Sonia is just going to make you a millionaire overnight, like that's not what she's doing. She's, I sort of, uh, the analogy is I'm a personal trainer, a really good one but you have to come to the gym. You got to do, you got to eat your chicken or your protein and drink your water and lay off the alcohol a few times a week. And if you do that, if you show up and you follow what I say and implement it, you will get what you want, but if only. And so, yes, of course, not that you asked, but there's absolutely been a small, albeit small segment of people who have seen all the cool stuff, add to cart, check out, enrolled, never once logged in because I can see all the analytics, right? So like I can see everything. And so- when they do make a comment, it's rare, but they're like, oh, I, I, I wasn't one of her success stories. I'm like, you never even logged into the, you're 20% through the material. <laughs> so how did, you know, so there was that aspect to it. And I don't know if we're going to touch on this later, but I want to share a recent win that we had that related to the 4L branding. Because so up until now, we were two weeks of trademarks for years, had all these other courses turned into a store. So now I have a whole store. And we joke that I'm the Amazon of trademark practitioner materials. You could go on right now, add to cart, check out and get your material. I don't have to be around. You could self-teach something. You could be ready for a consult by tomorrow, right? With my material. And it was just two weeks of trademarks and all these other courses, Sonia's stuff, right? Sonia's stuff or courses or whatever. And obviously with attorney education comes the natural question of, oh, well, you're teaching substantive law. Can I get CLE credit for this? And I'm not stupid. I knew day one, that would have been amazing. I also knew that is a, a climbing of a Mount Everest that at the time I didn't have the resources. And every time I tried, I kept running into a dead end, right? I mean, we as attorneys know that we need CLE credit. We as attorneys do not know how freaking hard it is to secure it in almost every state for the same course. I can get it for you in my local Georgia because that's my home bar, for example, or whatever. But yes, yeah, so that was an undertaking that I would not wish upon my worst enemy. It was a really hard feat. However, love sharing a good win because late la- middle of last year, we got, I had been working behind the scenes for a long time to get the attention of the ABA. And the ABA not only was impressed with what I had created, they, I mean, they were just, they approved it, loved it, were so supportive of it. And they're like, is that all you need? You need to give CLE credit for, for something that is literally teaching substantive law. And so I'm shortcutting for the purposes of, you know, a fun video. But anyways, we got ABA, uh, you know, we have a partnership with ABA to approve our court, the courses in almost every state. And so I was like, what have I done in a good way and a bad way? But that just the universe is, you know, the world's your oyster. So that's why we chose 4L because you know, it was time. So, yeah. That's cool. I, I, I want to ask you the offline. I want to ask you about that because, you know, I sure. know about, you know, I mean, think about it. You've got 50 plus jurisdictions. And so someone signs up for the course and they say, yeah, I want it for Tennessee, Georgia, California. So then all of a sudden on the back end, you've got to figure mm-hmm. out how to communicate with all those different jurisdictions to make sure it's delivered and they got the certificate and la 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 oh, you're which telling I'm sure me. <laughs> was a huge undertaking but we won't waste time now because i do want to ask something i don't want to keep you <laughs> i got you any questions yeah. you have anytime you have my email so yeah so i do want to ask you about marketing both for your law firm and for 4l you said you've never done any paid ads you're very good you get out there in the community you know i think you at least used to do a lot of speaking gigs i think Maybe you're big on social media. Mm-hmm. What were your channels? You know, what is it you do did then and what is it you do now to get the word out? And yeah. what and, and the last question on that, part three is what is the most effective for you and your brand? Sure. So marketing has always been my first love before even trademarks, right? And I've always been fascinated by the psychology of buyer behavior how purchasing decisions are made. I don't know why, but I always, I mean, I remember I'm probably from one of those freaking books I read in the library once when I was a kid, but I remember specifically checking out books on brand, like psychology of brand colors, like how, you know, fast food restaurants will choose red and orange because it incites hunger, but then doesn't make you comfortable. It makes you want to leave versus, you know, cool tones like blues make you feel relaxed. And there's so much that goes into building and brand and all this, but And so maybe that's why trademarks as a practice area resonated with me because it fit with that whole idea. In terms of a marketing plan, 
I never had one except that I would try something, see if it worked, try something, see if it worked. And sometimes I've been wrong. Sometimes I've been right. Sometimes I've been wrong. And when I've been right, I just follow that. I mean, it really is that simple. So I have and still do speaking engagements. I'm on podcasts. I speak at conferences. I host a number of my own webinars and informational thing, trainings that are really huge for getting the word out. I would say, you know, obviously I'm on social media. I'm a trademark lawyer lady. And I have been for years. So that was, a, it served a dual purpose, still does, of marketing for my law firm and marketing for, you know, the courses. Now it's probably more course driven. I think I'm just more well known for that. And I'm okay with that, right? Like that's not my, that was not my primary lead gen for the law firm. What has been the most effective is Facebook and not ads or anything. So very early on in 2018 or 19, I think I created a Facebook group called trademark attorneys slash lawyers, no creativity, zero. And I invited all of the colleagues I had asked them to do the same, invited all my students, asked them to do, you know, and it was like anyone and everyone, if you're remotely interested in what, as an attorney or, you know, paralegal law student. So this isn't to serve consumers with their trademark needs. Right. So I built a, a Facebook group. And so now we're almost at, we're somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 members on Facebook. And I don't have the exact numbers right now, but somewhere along that. And it just grew and people started, and I tell people, invite your colleagues, you know, and it was a forum to give support to one another, answer each other's questions, little finagles, you know, that kind of stuff. What do you use for this software? What's that? And students would post themselves. You know, I just want to share. I took Sonia's course and I learned this. If you're looking at it, you should really try it or you should really take a look at it. Or, you know, they would, somebody would ask and say, you know, I'm looking at this course. I know Sonia is, it's awkward because I'm like, oh, admin, I can see everything. But I try to stay out of it. I really my promise to myself and with the group is that it's not the Sonia show. This is not an advertising scheme for two weeks of trademarks. This is a true support community for the, the attorneys that are interested in trademarks or do currently, you know, some level of practicing it. And it's here to be a safe space for those attorneys. However, if there are questions about how to learn trademarks, someone will beat me to it. Right. So I'll share it eventually once I see it, that the post was made, but yeah, I mean, it has grown in and of itself. And so Facebook group has been probably one of the bigger um, avenues for that, I would say. Yeah. So, so, so let me ask about that. So I've got a Facebook account, but I have not been on Facebook. I maybe go in there once a year for the last eight years. Mm -hmm. So I really, I, I'm just not familiar with it. Is Facebook pretty active still? And then I guess how much time does it take for you to maintain that group or, or whatever? So it's active for the people. So if you're a user of Facebook, it, you, yes, it's active for only that segment. Obviously, there's a number of people that deleted their account or don't go on there for, you know, we've had all this data and privacy stuff over the years. So I completely understand the people that are on it. And I, what I've learned about that is that you've got to meet people where they are. So that's why you don't just do Facebook, for example. I've, I've learned that the people who do Instagram don't do Facebook typically. Like you you, you kind of have one platform. Everyone's busy, right? One area that I haven't been as big on is LinkedIn. I'll post occasionally, but you would think that would be where I would do it. And I'm getting more into that now. But as far as a time commitment, you know, when it was Sonia in the very early days and I was a sheriff and I'm wearing the firefighter and I'm the, you know, town hall mayor. Yeah, it was a huge time suck. But like I said, I have gotten myself out of a lot of things over the years by delegating. And so I have an amazing team behind me that, just never gets public credit, unfortunately. And they're okay with that. Like they don't want it. Right. I'm like, do you guys want to be more? And they're like, no, we don't. We're happy. Just, they love the mission. They're so proud of our students. They're here to support our current student base, prospective student base. And so I have a lot of help as the answer to the time question. I am not, I mean, sometimes I get on there, I have my phone and I'm on Instagram. So I would say it's sort of three primary channels right now that people hear and become more acquainted is the Facebook in general or the group itself. There are a number of other lawyer groups too. So Facebook lawyer groups are a thing. And if you're in, if you're not, then you're like, I have no idea what that's about. Then we've got Instagram. And then we've got obviously your email list. And I would say that's, you kind of have to double up. I don't think any one by itself is effective, but we do those three primarily, I would say. And the email always just reinforces, but then you have people who don't check their email, but they're on Facebook. So mm -hmm. there's, you just have to- Or it goes to spam. I've yeah. You know, I've yeah. got my email list. I've had it for years and, you know, it's not huge, but it's, you know, I send it once a week and, you know, when somebody I know, 
unsubscribes. It, it hurts a little, but you know, oh, we can talk I about that. I, that's a great thing that you brought up. And I'm so glad I'm not alone because people laugh at me. They're like, you're so like, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, I don't want to be crass, but like people say you're ballsy, right? You're so confident about taking risks about all these kinds of things that you of all people are afraid of email unsubscribes. And I'm like, email is the last channel of the three in terms of like the lowest of my comfort level and my, like what I want to do, but it, it is very effective. I hate sending mass emails. And that's why I don't, I probably undersend because every single unsub, I look, I don't care if it's seven people out of mm. 7,000. My, my list is uh, over 7,000 people at this point, seven people unsubscribing. That's a good I list. Look at each, that's good. It is, but I'm like, I'll look at yeah. all seven of them. I'm like, why do you hate me? And I, I've texted a couple of people and I'm like, did I do something to upset you? And they're like, oh my God, no, why? And I'm like, well, I, I'm, you're, this is going to sound silly, but you unsubscribed from my list. They're like, girl, I get your emails on multiple accounts, like my work email, my personal. That's all I was just trying to clean up. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so you don't hate me. Yeah. And so I probably understand, if anything. And maybe it's because I'm afraid of being the person that's too spammy, too this, too that. Because my forward mission has been to remedy what I went through and hopefully prevent that that struggle with anyone else if someone's serious about wanting to learn trademarks i hope that they don't go through what i did of making a million mistakes and getting chewed out by partners and ruining things and having to refile at your own expense and you know that was my primary mission is that and so yes i've turned it into a business but i also don't want to be accused of like a money grab or like nickel and diming people so i give away a lot of free advice i do a lot of free cle so ever since i got the aba partnership i have put on so many free CLEs. And I know we'll talk about this later. No one's going to be interested in this, but it is really expensive. I take such a huge expense, I guess is the right, right word to the tune of 500 to a thousand dollars per free CLE. By the time you count in every state and the application fees and the this fee and the certificate and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some states are more expensive than others. And some, you know, and so I suppose, I guess, that's the fourth channel. I didn't even think about it. I mean, in a sense, because that's newer. But yeah, that's, I suppose, the fourth channel is free CLE. So I do think I do enough free content and mentorship for the community that it, it's okay. But yeah, I hate unsubscribes. It makes me like so stressed. Well, you know, there's a lot of folks that I'm friends with that, and, and I'm on their list that they send the print newsletter because that's not going to get unsubscribed to. You're going to get it. throw it away. I had yeah. on my <laughs> podcast a while back family lawyer, Marco Brown out of Utah. And I'm pretty sure he said he sends a print newsletter to every attorney in the state, every single attorney in the state, I think every month. And he says he gets you know, crap about it. And it's like, well, you can just throw it in the trash, you know, it, but yeah. at least on the way to the trash, they see your name, right? You have they to can't, and they can't unsubscribe. Now it costs more, but yeah. So I know we've been going a while there. I, I want to wrap it up here in a second, but you know, for, the younger lawyers out there or the lawyers maybe not so young that are thinking about maybe starting a firm or dreaming about it. Are there any pieces of advice you would give them? Oh, how much time? Are you sure we don't have another 14 hours on that? Because I could, <laughs> I mean, as I'm sure you know, right. Having made your transition and your story is so fascinating too, of going through what, you know, is a fit maybe in one season of your life, but not another season, right? And, but you're, I mean, who better to speak on than being able to see both sides of partnership and then your own firm. And so I, you know, I've never been partner at another firm. I, I didn't stay long enough for that to happen. I mean, the advice, I've got tons, but I really think that the, this, I'm going to try and give something different. That's, I like to give something different that's not the usual, right? That you can't find by Googling or, you know, reading about it or anything. And I think that if I had to narrow it down to one or two pieces of advice or something, I would say, number one, you as soon as possible, the sooner you can figure out for yourself whether you are a an entrepreneurial business minded, can handle stress, chaos, problem solving, that kind of stuff, or if that just sounds terrible and you need certainty and assurance and stability and all these kinds of like, like the quicker you can figure out which column you're in and learn that about yourself. I mean, there's no right one there. We need both in this world. So I think that's really crucial because I see both. And it's a, such a shame to me when someone who is in the, I don't like certainty and, oh my God, I'm so overwhelmed and burned out. And that's how burnout happens. And it's just not a right entrepreneurship and running your own firm or running your own anything is not for everybody. Right. And if I can have one person save themselves from that journey, if they decide which 
column they fall into, I think that's really important. I think you need to gauge your comfort level with uncertainty, overwhelm, unexpected situations, unexpected issues. That's really important. The rest of it you can learn, but you really have to have a, you need to know which one you are. And if you're not, if you're not ready for that first category, don't do it. Yeah, don't do it. I think that is, are, it's a fun that is spot on. I think that is huge. You know, because there's all these messages out there. Go start your business, be a founder, lie. Everybody, it's like preaching it, but it is not for everybody. And if you try it and it's not for you and you don't succeed or you give up or, or move back, you might feel like a failure or something. You couldn't hack it. And, and you're right. It's not for everybody. So that is very wise. So again, Sonia, thanks for coming on. For folks out there that want to get in touch with you, you know, what's the best way if they're interested in maybe checking out your courses uh, or whatever, where can they find you? The channel. So LinkedIn, Sonia Lacani, easy to find. Instagram, trademark lawyer lady. If all else fails, 4leducation.com and that'll show you everything. And I am very responsive. My, my team and I should say are very responsive. So, I mean, everybody has all the tabs open all day long. You will get an answer. You will get an answer. Even if it's, let me find out for you, because people have questions about their individual state or their own situation of like, okay, I've filed three trademarks so far. Like, where do I fall in your course? You know, what do I need? Or what version of your course is best for me and stuff like that. But I I love mentoring Th- that the giving back of the education and preventing someone from being flailing around by themselves is the whole premise of what I built for L on. I didn't have to. So I will wrap up by saying this is that, you know, with the conversation of should you be an entrepreneur and how do you know what advice would you have? It's the ride of a lifetime in all the best ways if you're suited for it. it. All this stuff is true. It's the most delicious grind I've ever experienced. And similarly, if you're not right, that's why it's so important to figure out whether you're cut out for it or not, because and that's the way to do it. You don't have to do it to know if you're like, no, no that just sounds bad. Then I don't want to do it. But after my firm had the success that it did, I actually was and could have retired. That's the way I set up my financial situation. So, I mean, it did that well. 4L, everything from now on is this, I mean, it, it started as a passion project, but obviously it has grown into a very successful second business of its own, but it, it, it really is based on passion. And I, so I joke around, I'm like, I don't have to do this. I don't, I do not have to spend my energy doing this, but at the same time, you know, I'm not even 40 yet. So I feel I'm going to be 39 in a couple months. I feel like I have a long way to go and I, I love it. That's the thing. And so I keep coming back to that is that if this doesn't sound fun, then it's not going to be fun later. But if it's starting to sound kind of cool, I just, I love the ride of it. And so I feel like it's, it's important to note that you don't, you're not a failure if you're not a, a cut out for entrepreneurship. That's not at all. You're just, it's either chocolate or vanilla. Everyone has their preference. Well, again, thank you for coming on. And I, I think you just gave the show a title too, The Delicious <laughs> Grind. I love it. it. You know, it is the <laughs> most delicious grind. Um, I don't know if you have a hard stop on this or not, but I wanted to share one more analogy. Do you have a couple more minutes? Because I feel like I just yeah. landed yeah, on Yeah, go this. for it. Okay, because I'm fine. I, I added a buffer because these things always end up being great conversations. I would say that if, you know, especially as you're, you know, if you're graduating law school, chances are you're 25 or above, right? And if you're 10 years into your career, that makes you 35. That's if you went straight through. And so the conversation about parenting and having children is inserted and woven along the way. And I don't have children at the, myself. I am an auntie to my nieces and nephews. I'm a very involved one at that. I take my role very seriously. And I have a number of friends that are parents of children, right? The young children, I should say. It is the closest analogy to running a business. And so if you have children, however that is going for you, entrepreneurship is going to be the same way, probably. It's full of unexpected chaos and scenario and sleepless nights. And all this. But I bet if I asked almost any one of my friends and family members that are parents, they're like, wouldn't trade it for the world. Hardest thing I've ever done. It nearly takes me out some days, but wouldn't have it any other way. And that is how I feel about running a business. And so it is my baby, but it, it has so many parallels from what I can see in terms of the lifestyle and the, the way that your brain has to work and how, what you have to be, you, you wake up and you're like, I don't know, some days you're like, I don't know what fresh hell is waiting for me on this inbox, right? But then you have other days when the baby smiles or giggles or your kid comes home and they're like, you know, I love you, mom. I love you, dad. And you're like, oh, it's all worth it. And it's the same thing when you get those success stories or when I get those messages, they're like, they're literally, it's the best analogy I can make because my students are my babies. And when they win, I am like, 
I, I literally want to disintegrate and melt out of joy and it makes all the stress worth it. And so I guess, you know, I know nobody asked me about that, but I feel like it's a really good analogy that no one talks about. Entrepreneurship is just like parenting children and however that's going for you, it's probably the same. So yeah, for whatever that's worth, I wanted to add that. Well, I, I love that. That's, that's a great analogy. And yeah, it, it is, it, it can be the highest highs and the lowest lows, but, but it's fun. I'm with you. Hardest so, thing you've uh, ever done, but thanks trade again for the world. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks again for coming on. And, uh, we will continue this conversation offline because there's definitely some more questions I have. So, okay. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the founding partner podcast. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on the latest episodes. You can also connect with Jonathan on LinkedIn and check out the show notes with links to resources mentioned throughout our discussion by visiting www.yourlawfirmgc.com. We'll see you next time for more origin stories and insights from successful law firm founders.